Every day we are learning more about the plans behind the bomb scare in Times Square. And thought it, though it just happened days ago, some are moving swiftly for changes in U.S. security. Fox 61's Tom Lewis takes a look at just one angle, changes at airports and on planes. Faisal Shadad was moments away from getting away from U.S. authorities as he sat at an Emirates airline jet taxiing for takeoff. But as the plane approached the runway, agents ordered the plane back to the terminal. Shahzad was on the no-fly list, but a breakdown in communication between Homeland Security and the airline nearly let him slip away. Now changes are coming. Airlines will now be required to check no-fly list two hours after being told of changes. What we wanted to do was ensure that uh, there was a mechanism in place that requires that that list be continually uh, changed. Shazad reportedly made a practice run, driving into Times Square one night before he allegedly parked the SUV packed with explosives in Times Square. The gun found in Shazad's car when he was arrested at Kennedy Airport, well, that was purchased in Shelton two months ago. He had it with him in the car that he drove to JFK uh, Airport on, uh, on uh, Monday night. So uh, it, it appears from some of his other activities that March is when he decided to uh, put this uh, plan in motion. Now here now to talk about the response, what kind of response we ought to have, both in terms of security and policy, is Scott Bates. Uh, thanks, Scott, for being here. In addition to being the police commissioner uh, in Stonington, you're also the vice president of the Center for National Policy in Washington, D.C., so you wear a lot of different hats. Um, tell us your reaction initially to, um, first of all, some of these quick changes, as Tom just talked about, uh, being made at airports and on planes. Well, you know, a lot of these changes are long overdue, Lori, and the thing is that we have to adapt. Uh, uh, Al-Qaeda is a very clever foe, and uh, the Taliban and, and others who want to do us harm. So think about it. On 9-11, they took over the cockpit of the plane. So we barricade the cockpit, then they try, uh, try to do shoe bombs. So constantly they are changing their tactics. They used Arab guys to try and infiltrate. Now it's Nigerians, now it's U.S. citizens. So they are not standing still, so we have to always adapt and try to keep one step ahead of them as well. Do you have any um, specific ideas for adaptations in terms of, uh, because you do so much international travel, obviously, right. uh, that you would give, for instance, to the Homeland Security Committee? Sure. Well, I was just talk I used to work on the Homeland Security Committee, and I was in D.C. yesterday talking about these things. I think the first and foremost rule is for our nation not to overreact. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, we have to do all we can to protect the American people. Uh, that said, I think there's a case to be made that al-Qaeda is trying to lure us into overreacting, uh, clamping down on our own citizens more than we should. Uh, so that's the first rule. Second, this story has a lot of great angles to it. The real story, two American citizens saw something amiss. They took action. They called the police, the police within minutes. Uh, had the cooperation of the local citizenry, and then law enforcement at the state, local, and federal level rolled up this plot in record time. So this should make us all feel pretty good. And I would just say that the main thing we have to remember is that Americans should be vigilant and unafraid. That's the key. Terrorists win if we overreact, if we change who we are uh, in the face of danger. And what would be uh, your definition of an overreaction? Uh, invading countries uh, on a pretext, for example. Uh, this was done a few years ago. I worked out on Capitol Hill in 2003 when the Iraq War was ginned up, and I can tell you there was a lot of there were a lot of people uh, peddling fear of the unknown. We can't operate that way in the future. It's too costly for the United States. It costs us allies. It costs us support around the world to effectively combat terrorism. We have to have international alliances where we're getting good information and good cooperation like we are now in Pakistan. And what do we do here at home um, in terms of, you talked about fear because now we have this suspect, he's of Pakistani descent, mm -hmm. and uh, of course that builds up a lot of uh, emotion. Absolutely. Uh, the thing that we can't do is turn our back on who we are. This country was built on legal immigration. We get the best and the brightest from around the world, and we need to continue to have an open door. That said, we have to get control of our borders as well. And uh, I can tell you from firsthand experience, the borders are essentially wide open in the southern border. So we need to do more, use uh, UAVs, uh, high-tech sensors, cameras to kind of 
lock down that border and make sure that uh, we know who's coming into our country. That is important for us to do. I mean, are those ideas, I mean, in terms of like the cameras and things that are um, difficult to peddle in D.C.? Or You know, this is the funny thing. The cost of doing that is actually not that great compared to, you know, the other military operations we've taken, taken care of overseas. So this can be done. It's a question of political will. And uh, quite often, uh, there's a lot of partisan bickering in Washington. I would think that these kind of measures would be ones that we could all rally around at this time. What about the work that you do? Because you have been to the Middle East extensively. What about the work that you can do there to kind of um, nip the problem over there? Well, a lot of it, I think, is uh, presenting a good face of the United States overseas. And that means that we're not trying to impose our will on them. The Bush administration previously had said they were going to transform the Middle East. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure they asked the people in the Middle East if they wanted to be transformed. So just being productive partners, mm -hmm. showing that we care about, you know, mutual economic benefit, some trade, that kind of thing. We can't close our doors here in America when these kind of things happen because that's what they want us to do. Okay, and you are pretty frank about uh, the chances that the U.S. will be hit. I mean, you yeah. uh, to explain why you are that way and, uh, and what that should mean to people at home. Sure, well, uh, America's enemies, those that wish us ill, they, they can't challenge us militarily. The only way they can challenge us is in asymmetric warfare, which is things like cyber attacks and terrorism, uh, you know, sneaky little attacks. Mm -hmm. um, that will happen. And I think we've seen this, that there's only so much you can do. So our leaders need to be bold about this and say to Americans, we're all grown up here. Uh, we're going to do all we can to protect America, but we need to count on you, American citizens, to take security in your own hands. And if and when we are hit, uh, we will respond uh, and, and react in a positive manner. Uh, if you look at in Israel and Great Britain, they face terrorist attacks for years. And what they do is within hours, they treat it as a crime scene, they sweep up the mess, they take care of the injured, and they're back on their feet. That's what we need to be, a resilient nation, unafraid but vigilant. Do you think that the response here in Times Square was good? Outstanding. I mean, from top to bottom, from the people that were in the McDonald's and calmly walked out with their burgers uh, to uh, the local police. And let's not forget, police in Shelton and in Bridgeport are part of a national security operation. And for us in Connecticut, this means we need to support our local police departments and all the training they do uh, at the state and federal level. Interesting. Thank you. You have so many good ideas. I appreciate you coming, uh, Scott, to talk it's with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Thanks again to Scott Bates. Ahead, state lawmakers have taken action, though some might say inaction, on the budget. What it means to your wallet. We're going to talk about that coming up.